Uh, all right, so we've heard a lot about um, scaling different parts of the stack, um, but we're going to talk about scaling a, a different aspect, which is uh, authors. So uh, my name is Paul. I'm a UI engineer here. My name is Allison, and I'm also a UI engineer here at LinkedIn. That's a baby. Somebody's not on mute. <laughs> Too late to burn. <laughs> All right, cool. So, you know, what our, our team's mission at LinkedIn is really to empower teams um, across the whole organization to communicate better. And you've probably heard some people talk about this internal and external. Uh, Bo mentioned it, Neil Gash mentioned it when we first started. So, yeah, when we first started, our mission was to. Um, how do we communicate better with our members and our customers? Um, but about a year and a half ago, we started asking ourselves, well, what about within our own employees? Like, how can we improve communicating better, communicating better within our own organization? So, you know, we started asking that question. Can we just open up AEM for all employees at LinkedIn to create sites? Um, obviously, that can lead to a big mess. Um, and we kind of went through this journey of, of, kind of technically opening it up, but then realizing there's a lot more to it than just saying, here's, here's everything that you have. So the obvious question is, why would you want to? Um, for us, it was hearing from employees, hey, we want to communicate in a more polished way. Um, especially at a large organization, you need, more, you need more polished communication. All right. So. We started hearing that, um, and we realized, hey, we got this component library. We can make polished websites. Can we just open it up for people to use? So looking at the impact and kind of what we had to offer, we decided, why don't we give that a try? So in your typical development environment, this is where we started, too. You know, you generally have one site, regardless of how large or how, how small, and you have one main stakeholder that you work with. For us, that was our marketing communication partner. Um, and their, their marketing website. Um, relatively or simple organization, um, straightforward support, and you know you can communicate with your stakeholders because you know exactly who they are. Um, agreement is easily obtained. Uh, you know, agreement's always difficult, but at least you can work with your one stakeholder or your group of stakeholders to kind of do that. Um, so that's, that's kind of the typical environment that we started off with, and, and from what I hear, that's, that's how a lot of people operate. We, we also recognize that some teams have other roles that kind of alleviate some of the support. For example, uh, PMs or um, author training specialists. When we embarked on this journey of, can we just open it up to all employees at LinkedIn? We did not have that function, so it was just our team going down this path. So what he means by our team going down this path, we actually mean one lonely developer. Um, supporting all of these uh, functionalities in internal. Um, she was only dedicated part time to it as well. So when we first started, it was somewhat manageable. We were doing about six sites a week, so we would get a request and then create them. Um, at this point, everything had a manual creation process. We would have to create the site um, by hand or, or copy it or create a template, something like that. And then from there you would create the jam folder and then we also had separate permissions groups for them. Um, in addition, we were also supporting one to two stakeholders about uh, per site. So as you can imagine, uh, at the rate at which we were growing, uh, especially by word of mouth, that it pretty much wasn't going to be a zero cost to serve system. Um, onboarding often took about 15 to 20 minutes. Training would be a once a week, uh, 45 minute session or so, and then there's always the support questions. What's wrong? Why is my image not showing up? Did I do something? Uh, what's my publish page? You know, uh, typical authoring and even stakeholder questions. Stakeholder questions. So our solution to that was to create our own DIY tool. And this, uh, its purpose was to automate site creation because every time you make a site, those three main features of a site are the same steps every time. Um, and in addition, by creating a tool with an easy interface, we can open it up for authors to use at will. So that takes the developers outside of the site creation process. 
So this is our homepage uh, for Inkwell. So this is if you're an author and you want to go ahead and create a site, we would say, hey, come here to our page and learn more about it first. So Inkwell is actually our <laughs> second iteration. Uh, if you want to see what our first version of uh, our platform on AEM, it's actually like blog.linkedin.com. This is actually based off of our more, it's our newer front end pattern library. So this way, everything that we have on the platform has the same look and feel, and it's approved by LinkedIn.com. So internal and external all have the same look and feel. And just to clarify the name Inkwell, uh, we realized when we were transitioning from CQ5 to AM6, even the naming had some, some problems with kind of communicating that to all our authors. So we tried to create this name on top of it that kind of represents the functionality that we provided as opposed to here's the technology that we you know, currently on. So essentially, we, we branded our version, our experience of AEM as Inkwell. We even uh, customized the welcome page the uh, login page, and even a lot of the site admin stuff, we've uh, actually customized a lot of that to have the same look and feel as LinkedIn. So if you go to the LinkedIn page, you'll have a Get Started button, and it'll take you to this landing page. And basically, this tries to eliminate the need for people to really question what they're doing here. This will tell you, uh, this will make you think about if you really need this tool. Is something better for you? And if you need it, then these are the things that you need to have in order to create it. Um, the second step, so this actually looks familiar because this is the out-of-the-box implementation of what our site creation tool is on AEM. So what we've done is we've leveraged that, but customized it all on the back end. Um, so this second part is the same as the other part. Um, same thing as this one as well. You can choose your languages and then specify chapters here. So I'm pretty sure that you guys are probably familiar with this. So the magic happens here. When you're done, we actually give you the ability to go straight to your site and start editing. So this right here is an example of a fully populated site that we've created via the blueprint. Most of our authors actually choose a site that's like this and then customize it to what they need. The real backbone of this is to be able to create programmatically two separate groups because if you create a site we want you to be able to manage that site. That's your site. We want to give you ownership of it. And that means that you have two groups. One is an admin and one is an author. So the authoring is, is the same as normal. You give them permissions to read, uh, read, replicate, update, and delete the site, right? But the admin, you allow them to award permissions to other people or other LinkedIn authors. And then that way, that also takes the development or the developers outside of this system. So that's another part of support that we don't have to deal with. And finally, we have this beautiful template. So once you create your site, you get one of these emails and it gives you all the onboarding and training materials and resource links to your site. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> so, yes. So hopefully, that actually tries, we're, that's our attempt at automating and minimizing the support costs that we need for this system. So once we started, once we started onboarding more and taking off, so a lot of this is word of mouth as well. Like, hey, check out my site, or or people are advertising on, uh, like for example, Cinco, which is our, um, it's our it's our intranet. So, anyways, so basically, it's, it's uh, they're like announcing they're launching sites through there. It's all in the company info, and then a lot of people are like, hey, I want that for my site as well. So we started onboarding about 10 sites per month. Um, and that was fantastic because we did, took no developer effort to create these sites. However, we were onboarding about 20 authors a month, which means that our lonely developer was now developing or was now supporting 100% instead of being able to be a developer. So it didn't actually help us. All right. So. Like as you were saying, like we, we were getting way way more um, author support. So yeah, it's great that you can. We don't have to support creating new sites. We don't have to support adding new people. But then we run into the other problem that's still there. The more authors you add, we still get the same number of questions per author. It's probably the same same problem of support questions, training, documentation, which is nobody really likes to do that, but everyone asks for it. Um, 
So our solution at the time was simply to add more people. That was the simplest solution. Um, you can probably start thinking through problems with that, but we'll get to that, that later. Um, so we started adding more people. Rather than training individual authors, we started doing uh, group training. Uh, through our support channels, we started adding rotations of developers. Um, and we started trying to create documentation. Um, and yeah, so th this is uh, Ali giving us, give us some training. Obviously, it looks like there's only one person in the room. I promise there are more people dialed in. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we had we had different developers giving uh, different training. Uh, we started creating a new we created an, an internal site ourselves to kind of hold our documentation. Unfortunately, there were a lot of dead ends um, where I threw up just photos of cute puppies to ah. alleviate people's concerns. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we we kind of reached these really large numbers and kind of piecemeal together this support system. But I think the really big concern is not that could we continue to support it, but we were also taking time away from ourselves as developers. Yes, this was important to our team, like we recognized it was creating impact, but do you really want your developers to be support people? And that's that's kind of the problem we ran into. And how do we how do we scale that part of it? Yeah. Because obviously adding more developers is not a scalable solution. Um, it, it's not really a zero cost to serve system is what our ideal state is. Um, authors will quickly outpace the number of developers, even exponentially in some cases. And it, but it does help us uncover a lot of manual parts of the site process that we can improve on by taking ourselves out of. So our solution to this was to start scaling our resources in a, in a smarter manner. So by doing this, we would start leveraging authors and other organizations. So for example, um, we created a Slack channel where authors can help and answer each other's questions, things like that, opening it up to um, what we call our Inkwell support champions. So we took our power authors, the people who are engaging often with us, engaging with other people, becoming author and leaders for us, and we created a championship program where they would be kind of like our forefront runners or the experts towards uh, the the company, so they would be our experts facing the company in that sense. Uh, we also created an FAQ that handled like seventy percent of our questions, pretty much. Um, so, in the future, with the shift, uh, as with any company, we're going to be shifting technologies often. We found that um, internally, we host about five thousand sites on, on Google Sites. Most of them are probably inactive or orphaned or single campaigns. Uh, so, but what we're, happening, we're seeing now is as we shift away from Google Sites, we're expecting a large influx of these internal sites that want a different solution. So we're expecting maybe about a quarter of these to be at least inquiries, right? That's not even the fully conversion rate. As for the number of authors, uh, we can only guess. <laughs> So to handle this, we've put into motion um, several plans or several initiatives to handle this influx. So one is to create a community type Q&A platform, a lot like the Stack Overflow. So we're looking into different technologies to do that. That way our champions can actually advocate for us in that sense as well. Plus, being an expert on that would also give them acknowledgement and recognition. Um, build out our championship program, that's obvious, obviously one of our um, goals as well. We want to be able to use them to leverage, for example, get information on new features that we're creating, um, get them to help us in creating authoring trainings or identifying sore points in, in the authoring experience. Uh, we want to create shared documentation platform where we can share the responsibility of, for example, a component library. Right? There's, all, there's a different audience of people that actually need that. There's developers, there's authors, there's designers. Um, all of that we're hoping to be able to create a platform where they can share and, and communicate. Um, we want to continue platform automation. Before this, we're only focusing on creating sites, but we're not focusing on sunsetting these sites. For example, how do you locate a site that's no longer used? What, was, what if it was a single campaign? That's a lot of content and a lot of information that we need to manage that we really don't. So a lot of our, um, a lot of that would also be based on creating and 
and uh, identifying the information that would allow us to say, hey, we don't need this on our site. And eventually what we wanted to do was an equal university type of thing where we would gather all of our resources and tailor courses into what type of author that you were needed. So for example, if you're an author or if you're an editor or a contributor or a manager of a site, you would have specific resources that were targeted for you. So what did we learn from this endeavor? First of all, we learned to engage your stakeholders. Right? So whether that's a single stakeholder or that's, a, that's every author that has a site on a, or on our Inkwell, right? Because by engaging them, we give them a sense of ownership. And that in turn incentivizes them to come back and help us as well. Like for example, the championship program. That comes back as, as time for us because the more that they take on, the less that we have to do. Um, also, consider support methodology and not just technical implementation. Because a lot of times in the AM environment, at least that I've seen, you can develop very, very quickly and it's really easy to just pump out features, but, but not provide like, documentation for your authors and your stakeholders. But we found out that by beefing up a lot of our support, we actually mitigated a lot of our support costs by just simply creating documentation and giving it to them. So a lot of our questions were fielded by basically, hey, how do I create permissions? Oh, follow this tutorial, you know? So <laughs> that's pretty much what we found out here. And then the, the final thing we want to share is uh, like the scale beyond your team. So I think it's the, our general um, approach to things is we have this knowledge, let's share it with our one stakeholder, and that's great. We can guarantee that the information is correct, that you know we're, it's going to be followed, and that's it. We, we're starting to go down this path of essentially a decentralized approach where we have a lot of different um, people who are very knowledgeable Maybe not 100% about everything, but we're, we're learning to trust them and learning to, rather than you know, get really mad if someone says something wrong, to learn to correct and guide them down the right path. So I would use my own a, a personal example where you know, somebody asked me, hey, is it possible to copy components between different pages? And I was like, no, I don't think that's possible. And someone actually corrected me. And I think for me that was a really big moment where I learned, you know what, like, it wasn't great that I gave the wrong answer. Let, let, let's be clear about that. But it was a good learning opportunity for kind of the community in general when someone steps in and is like, actually, it is possible and here's how you do it. So learning to go down this decentralized path has been really helpful for our team to scale um, the way it has. Um, so hopefully, moving forward, there'll be a lot, a lot less mess than when we first started. Um, we just kind of ran into some some growing pains, and we're hoping that we will continue to alleviate those. So, and thank you. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Um, I think it sounds like the, it's pretty templated, right? The sites there, and there's a limited set of components that are available. How do you handle new feature requests or? I have a campaign and hey, the vendor gave me this code and this is what I want to use and how do you handle those kind of feature requests or new component requests? Uh, very, very gently. Um, you know, I think, I think we hear a lot of the same, the same problems where it's like, I want this, I want that. And we, we have a request form where we just start taking those requests in. And for, especially internal features, it's, a, it's usually a, a numbers game where it's like, have a lot of people ask for it. And then we start considering, okay, what's the value of it then? And is it usable across the whole platform? Um, I think that's still something that we're trying to work out. Um, but that's that's kind of, is there enough volume? And then is there enough value is kind of the second part. Again, I'm very impressed. Everything I've seen here is awesome. You guys are taking on a very, very big challenge using an out-of-box solution. And Try and make it available for all of the different stakeholders. Um, did you have a challenge with one stakeholder, which was didn't work? Like, I think we had this uh, whenever we try to sell something to us. Essentially, it comes out and they want a lot of customization. And how do you deal with that when uh, when they say, you know what, we like this, but we want this, 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 and this, and this, and that? How do you control that? Um, that's one question I have. 
I mean, we'll, we'll both answer this one. Um, I think for us, it's being and getting more and more clear immediately. Here's what we do well. If you have these other needs that we actually hear about quite often, um, here's some other potential platforms that you can use internally that will do it. A, a good example for us is um, like how do we restrict content? It's possible to do with AEM, like how do we restrict content, but we just don't think that's the best use case for us. We're still evaluating it, but there's other potential platforms right now that you can use for it. So it's, it's being more upfront with like, here's what our use case is. And uh, <clears throat> did you find like a sweet spot of component size and containers that works very well for training? Because we notice once that component list goes above 50 and 100, and it kind of becomes really hard to train our users. Uh, do we try to constrain it into like a sweet spot there? So the easiest answer is yes. So we try to keep our component list very small, uh, as small as we can make it, because at least that way um, it is maintainable in that sense. Um, the other thing that we try to do is, is um, try to limit what their use cases are. So for example, if they, suggest, if they request a feature that we want, um, a lot of times we'll communicate. So that's the hardest thing we do sometimes, right? We'll communicate that, hey, if you want this feature, we'll you want all these other features at the same time. And the truth is we can't do all those features. So what you're gonna have to do is prioritize. Tell us what you want the most. Also, do you, you ask them constantly, do you really need this feature? Is it a one-time thing or is it something that you can use? Because you want us to spend three weeks here building a one-time implementation or do you want us to use three weeks here on something that you know that you can use? So a lot of the times we just don't think about things in that term. Um, traditional, the problem here is traditional development, right? Yes, I'm oh, sorry. Let me add on to that. Um, I think another important thing is to build connections uh, within, especially if you're within a larger company, to build connections with people so you know what's coming ahead and plan for it. Uh, so for example, one of the things that's happening to us right now is, um, I don't know how many of you know, but you know we were acquired by a certain larger company. <laughs> and um, you know, for purposes, for many, many good reasons, we're now evaluating, hey, what are some of the other uh, Microsoft products that we could go to, SharePoint's one of them. And so we recognized this and reached out early and said, hey, look, when we're talking about migration, let's figure out exactly what Inkwell, you know, our platform is great at and what SharePoint is great at, and let's broadcast this so that we don't end up with too many people coming to us and saying, I want this component, I want this component, I want 50 or 500 components. That, that way we can broadcast clearly, this is what we do. We do polished sites amazingly well. We don't do your typical like, I just want to hack on something together and then you know have, have 10,000 other people work on it. It's not really a use case. You know. As part of the overall training, do you guys provide a certification or accreditation? Well, that's, uh, that's the goal. That's the dream for Inkwell University. But for as of right now, we're still building out that program. Um, but yes, we were, we were thinking about that. And then continue all like education. So as versions of the software, right, what other capabilities are available? So yes, we are also planning to do continual uh, trainings because a lot of this as well can be used when onboarding new developers as well, especially if you've got a high turnover rate for teams or rotation, something like that. This this documentation always comes in handy. There is this platform called LinkedIn Learning that we are going to use to do that. We have a similar thing where we roll out dynamic sites. Uh, so one uh, problem that we usually run into and that you briefly mentioned on uh, was how you are planning to either uh, delete the ones that are not in use or say reuse. Uh, so what is the current approach that you take towards it and how is it planned? No, I mean, you can answer it. So right now we're, we're evaluating what type of metrics to use for that, but primarily we we're looking at probably analytics, uh, simply because that's easy to do right off, uh, right off the bat, easier than other other metrics. Um, also, we'd be checking, like for example, how often it was 
Uh, it can be a combination of factors as well, right? How often is it changed? How often uh, do authors access that page? A lot of these other factors can go into that. So we do have an infrastructure in place to measure, like for example, page views and everything. And we do have an API to find out how many page views a page has got and everything. So based on that, we can make a decision on like auto recycling and everything. But before that, it will be as simple as just sending an email to author. I um, mean the owner, because we know who the owner and author of the site is. So we are just going to send them an email, oh, your site is not getting any traffic. Do you want to delete it? Click this button to say yes or no. They say yes, it will get deleted. And if they don't do anything, we'll delete it. <laughs> In the next 20 days. <laughs> localization requirements and how you are handling your platform? So right now internally we don't have localization um, a requirement right now, but Apaji can talk about localization externally for us. In the we have an automated localization, but there's a nationalization, but you can create a site with any language. Yeah, so um, local site, regional sites, are created manually as well as we have that uh, process that we are um, introducing. Um, so we have role server in-house for uh, localization and integrating AEM with role server um, is a, a translation. So I think there are two parts of localization. I mean, I, I'll cover the second part. Is one is the content which is actually generated by author. We are going to leverage world server and the world server connected to do that. Like they can submit their page for translation and we do have a huge translation team for LinkedIn.com. We going to leverage to do the translation. And the second part is the code translation, like the things that you write in your SQL, in your DSP and everything. For that we have an automated process which comes with the LinkedIn tooling. So what we do is we just submit like a key value pair and then the process fix it up and then do the translation for the language with that we ask and then give us back to us. And then we use the IIT and it comes out of the box with Sling to render those stuff. And, uh, about the workflow, how you done any customized workflow? Uh, customized workflow. Um, the only customized workflow that we have right now uh, is for the staging preview and all. So before if someone wanna uh, activate their pages, what we do is we let them do activate the staging and then we have a tool where they can see the staging URL in production URL based on mapping and all other things and then they can preview and then submit it. And then uh, for translation we use out of the box. Just around the uh, publisher activate the staging. So are they they're working in a production author? Uh, but when you activate, you can activate directly at staging. Yes. And then is it triggering a workflow then to move that from stage to production, or do you just do a new activation to production? You do a new activation to production. So it's like promoting. So what you do is just you first activate to staging, you check everything is fine mm -hmm. in publish instance, and then you go ahead and activate. The normal activation always moves to production, as well as staging, as well as there. That's how we actually sync the content across all the environments. So we have chain replication set up for that purpose. Does your staging environment have a stage author as well, or is it you have staging uh, publishers that are specific for your author? Um, so all these environments that I have mentioned have the combination of both author and as well as publish instance. Okay. Usually authors don't go to staging environment to author, but sometimes they do. Sure. Like what uh, what they do is they create content and everything in staging, and then there is this concept of packaging the content, which comes out of the box with the AM, which you can package it from the staging and put it on production. Usually they do it on production, and then they activate on staging and that's it. And then we have customized the front end, where because one of the problem that we ran into uh, was to see if the things is only activated on staging but not in production. So we have customized the site admin which tells if this page is only activated on staging or only activated on production or what is the current state so that author know where this content is right now. Hi, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, is um, testing the page on current production space, also testing the same page on 
the new release that's coming up. So if you want to test it on the new release that's coming up, push it to stage and test the page on it. If you want to test the page on current production code base, there is a test and run and that they publish it to and verify it before pushing it live. So that's how we ended up having four in one application. One is dev and one is stage, one is test, which has production code. Right. And when we have production code. Hey, um, I just have a question um, regarding to, um, I think I saw some screen um, with, um, you know, the Psyche and the classic UI. So I just want to know, like, is there any reason that um, you are still, you know, using classic? Um, and then I know that Adobe is already, you know, having the classic UI um, deprecated um, later next year. And then, you know, in the future, it will be removed support. Um, and also, the second question would be, um, you know, for that, um, for all the internal size tooling and all that, um, you know, if you know everything is built very custom, then when you migrate it to, you know, the newer version of AVM and with the new uh, technology and best uh, practices, would it be, you know, a, a whole lot of work to redo everything, or how? What's your thought on those? Sure. I mean, I, I can answer both the questions, but you guys want to chime in. Yeah. The first one, glad you asked that question. Uh, we have the Dutch UI in our roadmap. We have done a lot of customization on the classic UI right now, uh, and then that involves a lot of author trainings and everything too. Uh, so we are looking into Dutch UI, and then we have a plan to maybe migrate all the sites and everything that we have to Dutch UI. If not, the end of this year, start of next year. Um, about the second question, so here, <coughs> even though, though we, we do a lot of customization, we try to stick to what comes out of the box with AEM, like both in terms of technology and practices and then everything that we use. So I don't think so we'll have a lot of issues, like if the things will change. That's the reason last time, I mean, when we did a upgrade from, we started with 5.4 uh, 5 if I remember, and right now we are in 6.1. And then we have a plan to do 6.2 the end of this quarter. And the time that we have allocated for doing that upgrade is less than a quarter, if, uh, if I remember. So that's that much confidence we have. Like to upgrade to an instance from like one version to another version will take less than a quarter. So we have not done a lot of customization in that sense. And then that I would recommend to anyone like who is using AEM2 is not to overdo what AEM already provide out of the box. If you have other reasons to do it, like we didn't talk about a lot of other product that we work on as well, but we work on variety of other products as well, which we have written on Python, we have written on Scala, we have written on other stack. So based on what the requirement is from the user, we don't want to accommodate it in AEM. We try to find out what the correct technology solution for that problem is, and we try to implement it over there. So. I would suggest to do the, do the same, like if you do have a requirement coming, try to use different stack, which is well suited for the requirement that they have. Yeah, any other questions? Oh, do we have anything online? Um, any question? I don't see any question online. online. No. All right, nothing on the feed. Okay, 